Uh, that is that is so cruel, isn't it? I loved watching that show. I'm sorry it's not on anymore. It's probably good it's not on. Fear, fear sets off a stressful stimulus in our brains, which then releases chemicals in our bodies, causes our hearts to race, our, our breathing to increase, our muscles become energized, and this built-in reaction is known as the, uh, the flight or fight response. The stressful stimulus that sets off this response can be anything like a spider, someone holding a knife to your throat, an, audition, an auditorium full of people waiting for you to speak, um, a sudden thud of your door frame slamming, or your door slamming against a door frame, even receiving some bad news. The brain is a very complex organ made up of more than 100 billion nerve cells in an intricate network of communications that is the starting point of everything that we think and sense and do. And some of these communications lead to conscious thoughts and actions, while, um, but the fear response in our brain is entirely autonomic. We don't consciously trigger a fear response or even realize what's going on until the fear has run its course. And when we're exposed to short-term or long-term, particularly intense, fearful situations, our brain has a tendency to hyper-focus on things that are scary in the world, even when we're back in a safe environment. This is, that's the root of things like post-traumatic stress disorder and other anxiety disorders. And sadly, many of us operate our daily lives today under the recurrent autom autonomic response of fear and anxiety and stress because frankly there's a lot going on in the world today that is really scary. Things like the radical Islamic terrorism that has infiltrated the planet, the conflict in the Middle East, the rise of mass shootings that we see taking place, government instability, financial uncertainty, job insecurity, insecur to make matters worse, with the advent of smartphones and streaming videos, it allows us to keep a constant fearful vigil of all the breaking bad news that's taking place in the world today. We've become a planet of people driven by fear. Well, I want to take you back to the Roman Empire to around 64 AD because it's a very scary place for people of faith back then. The Emperor Nero set fire to Rome and he blamed the already detested Christians, thus setting off one of the worst persecutions of believers that the world has ever known. Some have already been scattered to the outer regions of the Roman Empire. I think we have a, a verse there. And um, many will be put to death simply because they believe in this Jewish Messiah named Jesus. There are even stories about how, how Nero used Christians as human torches to light his extravagant outdoor parties. And so the Apostle Peter writes to these fearful believers because their flight or fight response to the scary things taking place was causing them to react in ways that were inconsistent for people of faith. They were being driven by fear rather than driven by hope. And in this letter that Peter addresses, um, he addresses how hope should drive their lives in the trials that they face, in their personal development and transformation, in their politics, in their workplace, in their families, and in their, both, their most basic need to feel secure and loved. And so for the next 10 weeks, we're going to be going through the book of 1 Peter in a series that we're calling Driven by Hope. And our goal in this series is to exchange the fears that we have for hope so that we can live out the radical life that God intends for all of us to live. So today's message is called The Way Home. And our text is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And we're going to break it into three segments. I'm going to look at the first uh, verses 3 through 5 right now. So here it is. It'll be on the screen behind me. And I actually love these um, three verses. Listen to them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Messiah Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I'll stop right there. 
Peter is telling these fearful believers that faith in Jesus provides a guaranteed future. You see, through faith, they have been reborn, made renew into what Peter calls a living hope, not a dying hope. And it's so important to, to know that it's a living hope. A good way to see the difference between these two paradigms is that a person with a living hope lives life like the dawn when the sun is on the rise. While a person who lives with a dying hope lives their life like the dusk while the sun is setting or sinking in the horizon. A person with a living hope of dawn sees the road ahead as an endless opportunity with a bright future, no matter what might be taking place in their life or in the world at the moment. While a person with the dying hope of dusk sees the road ahead as the end of opportunity with a dark and bleak future. One thrives in any environment, while the other regresses, especially in difficult environments. One is driven by hope, while the other is driven by fear. Now, Viktor Frankl was a Jewish neurologist and psychiatrist, and he was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp during the Holocaust. Frankel lost his wife and most of all of his family in the death camps, but he survived and he was eventually liberated and he wrote a book. And the book is entitled, the real title is Saying Yes to Life in Spite of Everything. A psychologist, experience, a psychologist experiences the concentration camp. We know the name here in America by the title Man's Search for Meaning. I bet a lot of you have read that book. It's a great read if you haven't read it. Uh, in this book, Frankel describes the life of an ordinary concentration camp inmate from the objective perspective of a psychiatrist. One of the things Frankel was fascinated with was how if, if you were able to, to avoid being taken to the gas ovens, one of the things Frankel was fascinated with was how some were able to survive in the camps until they were liberated while others simply gave up their will to live and died. And his observations led him to conclude that those who had something to hope for in the future survived, and those who had lost all hope didn't. It was plain and simple as that. Frankel tells a story about how one year a rumor began to spread around the camp that they would be liberated by Christmas. Hope was very high that year in anticipation of their release, but when Christmas came and went without any liberation, this is what Frankel wrote about what happened in the camp. He says this, the prisoner who had lost hope in the future, his future was doomed. The death rate in the week between Christmas 1944 and New Year's 1945 increased in camp beyond all previous experience. In my opinion, the explanation for this increase did not lie in the harder working conditions or the deterioration of our food supplies or a change of wealth or new epidemics. It was simply that the majority of the prisoners had lived in the naive hope that they would be home again by Christmas. As the time drew near and there was no encouraging news, the prisoners lost courage and disappointment overcame them. This had a dangerous influence on their powers of resistance and a great number of them died. Hope is to our souls what oxygen is to our bodies. Without hope, we're doomed, just like our bodies are doomed without oxygen. Proverbs 13, 12 says it really well. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when our hope sinks like the setting sun, darkness infects our soul, and we can become emotionally and physically sick. We can even die. But through faith, through faith, we have become born again, transformed into people of hope, an ever-rising hope, not an ever-sinking hope. And it's so important to understand that biblical hope, when the Bible talks about hope, it's never a wish, but always an absolute certainty. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. A wish may or may not come to pass like the prisoners were wishing to be liberated before Christmas, but biblical hope is always something that is 100% guaranteed. And the hope Peter is talking about here 
is a perfected eternal future that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, being preserved in heaven for us under the protective care of God himself until he's ready to reveal it at the end of his story, history. And nothing that could be thrown at these believers could change that reality, nothing. Paul says it in Romans 8, 38, 39 this way. He says, for I am sure, I'm sure, I have hope, I have a certainty that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth and then he kind of just fills in the whatever blanks you might have nor anything else in creation. It kind of takes care of everything, doesn't it? will be able to separate us from the love of God in Messiah Jesus, our Lord. You see, through faith, our destiny with God is guaranteed. Now, our destiny starts when we believe in. Eternal life starts now. And through faith, our destiny with God is guaranteed, even though the people that, P- that Peter's writing to are being persecuted and were being used as human torches to light Nero's evening parties. Even death itself, even death itself cannot extinguish hope in a brighter future because our future is guaranteed by God himself. And this guarantee of an eternal future that could never, ever be taken away should have a profound effect on how we live our life today. Not by a sinking, dismal future driven by fear, but a rising, promising future driven by hope. All right, Peter goes on in verse 6 and 7, and he says this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved with various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found and result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's talking about here a purifying pathway. And so we have a guaranteed future, and now we have a purifying pathway. Gold is one of the most precious metals on this planet, but it's not always pure when it's mined. And so to remove, remove these impurities in gold, which is called dross, dross literally means uh, worthless, And so to remove these impurities in gold called dross, gold is heated up to a liquefying temperature which causes the the worthless properties to come to the surface and to be allowed to skim away. These first century believers were definitely feeling the heat. But like the refining process of gold, heat is the only way to remove the worthless impurities in our life. Someone once said, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. And heat, the heat of suffering, the heat of trials, the heat of challenges in our life is how God refines us to make our faith pure and complete. James says it this way in in, in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. He says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I'll tell you, I wish there was a cooler path to transformation. I really do. But unfortunately, heat is the most effective and lasting path to a pure and deeper faith. And although going through the refiner's fire is never pleasant for anyone, those who have passed through the fire and have gone on to the other side understand that they would never, ever be who they are if they hadn't gone through that fire. God has put me and Andrea through some pretty high temperatures during our journey of faith, and most of those painful trials we've had have been things that have happened in our family. But I wouldn't be the kind of person, I wouldn't be the kind of pastor I am today without those trials. Andrea wouldn't be the kind of wife and mother and counselor that she is without those trials. And we both love hanging out with people who have gone through the refiner's fire and have come out on the other side. Because listen to this, people who go through these tough times and come out on the other side no longer have cheap answers to tough questions. 
They allow for more mystery in life. They, not everything needs to be so black and white. They, they, they're content not to understand everything or have to fix everything. They have a softer demeanor. They have, a, they have more empathy and compassion, especially for those who live and think or even believe different from them. And so are you feeling the heat in your life today? Are you in the fire? God is using that situation to refine you. And as painful as it may feel right now, someday you'll look back and you'll say, I'm glad for the person God has transformed me into. I could never have gotten here without going through that. There's no other way. You're not going to find it in the Bible. There's no other way. Heat is a transformer. And so... In our passage today, Peter speaks about a guaranteed future. He speaks about a purifying pathway. And finally, he speaks about an inexpressible joy. Verse 8 through 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, it might seem strange to read earlier in James and now here in 1 Peter that we should have joy in the face of severe trials. But when you understand the kind of joy that they're writing about, it makes sense. Peter calls it an inexpressible joy. So it's not the kind of joy that causes you to run down the street clicking your heels and cheering, right? And it's not the kind of joy that you see when today in sports, when, like when somebody makes a touchdown and does the touchdown dance, you know? It's not that kind of arrogant, prideful kind of joy. No one was cheering or clicking their heels while they were being lit as human torches. And no one was doing the, the, the dance, you know. The, what's, I, I'm black hair, blank hair, you know. Yeah, that dance. <laughs> Simply for believing in Jesus. It really stinks to get old. That's another heat right there, right? You feel the heat the older you get. This joy, the joy that Peter is talking about, is silent. And it's found deep within our souls. It's not on our lips. It's the kind of joy that only comes when we understand that although we might be living in a scary, dark place and it feels like nighttime, we have hope that the dawn is coming. I love Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. And that unshakable confidence in a brighter future produces a silent sound of joy deep within our souls. It's unspeakable. It cannot be expressed in words. But you know it's there. It's a confidence that God will bring us safely to our eternal home. We are on a journey. And God will bring us home. Apollo 13 was the seventh manned mission in the Apollo space program and the third intended. It was intended to make it to the moon. It never made it. The craft was launched on April 11th, 1970 from the Kennedy Space Center, but the lunar landing was aborted after an oxygen tank, ex oxygen tank exploded two days later while they were in space, crippling the service module upon which the command module depended. And it was a scary time. Those of you that remember this, it was just really a tense time. It took, they were up there for, for six days. And uh, at, at that point, it wasn't certain that they were going to make it back. But miraculously, uh, the crew returned safely six days later on April 17th. During those tense six days of uncertainty, news coverage ran almost continuously. And at one point, one of the news stations broadcasted a previously recorded interview with Apollo flight, 13 flight commander Jim Lovell just before the craft was launched. And the news reporter had asked Jim Lovell, is there anything in your past that has made you afraid? What an appropriate question to ask a guy who's stuck in space. I mean that would be stuck in space. And Lovell tells the story about how he, at once he was lost at sea in the absolute dark of night. Couldn't see a thing. His, his flight instruments went out. The, the, the aircraft carrier that he was going to land on was dark because they were in enemy territory and they couldn't turn the lights on. 
They had no idea that he didn't have his instruments. And his answer is both ironical, given his situation, and inspirational. That somehow or another, an event will take place that will get you back home. I want you to watch this clip and be inspired by it. Apollo 13 Commander Jim Lovell has more time in space, almost 24 days already, than any other man. And I asked him recently if he ever was scared. Oh, well, I've had an engine flame out a few times in an aircraft and was kind of curious as to whether it was going to light up again, things of that nature. But uh, uh, they, they seem to work out. Is there a specific instance in an airplane emergency when you can recall fear? Uh, well, I tell you, I remember this one time, I'm, uh, I'm in a banshee at night in combat conditions, so there's no running lights on the carrier. Uh, it was the Shangri-La, and we were in the Sea of Japan, and my, my radar had jammed, and my homing signal was gone because somebody in Japan was actually using the same frequency, and so it was, it was leading me away from where I was supposed to be. And I'm looking down at a big black ocean, so uh, I flip on my map light, and then suddenly, zap, everything shorts out right there in my cockpit. All my instruments are gone, my lights are gone, and I can't even tell now what my altitude is. Uh, I know I'm running out of fuel, so I'm thinking about, uh, about ditching in the ocean. And I, I look down there, and then in, in the darkness, there's this, uh, there's this green trail. It's like a long carpet that's just laid out right beneath me, and it was the algae, right? It was that phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship, and it was, it was, it was just leading me home. And now, if my cockpit lights hadn't shorted out, there's no way I'd have ever been able to see that. So uh, you, uh, you never know what, what events are going to transpire to get you home. You never know what events are going to transpire to get you home. But you can trust that no matter what events do transpire in your life, God will use them. He'll turn the heat up, but he'll use them. And your future is guaranteed. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. So I don't know what you're going through right now. I know that in a room this size, there's a lot of us that are going through tough times. And it's just a scary place to live right now in the world. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us that hope, hope is an anchor for our souls. It keeps us grounded. It's, it's, it's what oxygen is to our bodies. When you have lost hope, you've lost everything. But Peter writes and he tells us we have this incredible hope, undefiled, pure, preserved for us by God himself. And nothing, nothing that takes place in our life, nothing that's taking place in your life right now can separate you from God's love. He is anchored to us. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for hope. For without it, we're hopelessly lost. But through faith, we've been born again into a living hope. We anticipate sunrise. Brighter and brighter future. With every breath that we take, the next breath takes us closer to being home for good. And until that time, Father, I pray that you'd help us learn this message through this series that we would be able to drive our lives with hope and that fear would not paralyze us. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help all those in this room who struggle with anxiety and depression and hopelessness and phobias, that you would break those things and that the reality that our future is guaranteed And that you purify our pathway. And that we can have this 
joy that's deep inside of us to know this without a doubt. I just pray that you would light us up that way, that we would be able to live with wild abandon now, despite whatever circumstances are going on in the world or in our lives. That we would be live our lives sold out for you. And so I pray in your name, Father, our healer, our protector, our rock. I pray that you would impart hope to us. Thank you for being an anchor for our souls because you are our hope. And I pray it in Jesus' name.
want to read to you the entire passage that we covered this morning all together because we wrote, it was a little choppy, breaking it up like that. So just listen. Just soak it in. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Messiah Yeshua from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let that be an anchor for you this week. God bless you. We hope to see you next week.